any preacher that I have any more respect and love and appreciation for than I do Dr. Havner. And uh, I, I thought maybe tonight we might do this as a gesture of our appreciation and respect for this man whom God has left with us for these years. He's 72 now and still going strong. And uh, I thought maybe before he comes to speak for us, we might just stand in appreciation and honor this man. Dr. Havener, we love you. Would you come and speak for us at this time? Thank you. You may be seated. <coughs> Thank you. Let me take a moment to say how very much I appreciate this opportunity to have this renewed fellowship with you for these few days. I uh, have come at a particular and peculiar time in my life when at 72 I have to readjust and start over, as it were, and uh, it's exceedingly difficult. Uh, as you know, Ms. Havner was with me before when I was here and was with me for 33 years all over the country. It's not easy to readjust everything at this age and be back where I was because there are no children and it's just me again, and that calls for a lot of planning and uh, rearrangement of everything. It's been good to be with your pastor again, and I want to say how much I appreciate the fact that he and uh, Brother Dell and uh, Brother Good over here and others uh, seen to it every day that we went out together for uh, the noon meal and sometimes for other meals. And uh, that means a lot to me right now, especially because uh, of the loneliness. And it isn't good to sit in a motel room all day long and uh, be by yourself too much. I'm appreciative of the way the preachers have helped me. The last meeting was in Tampa, and dear Dr. Ho came every day and so to it that we went out together and sometimes got with others. I, uh, this means more to me than you can realize this present time. It's been great and uh, I value it more than I can say. This plain sort of preaching is calculated to get down to where we live. I remember going out to a country church not long ago. One of the old farmers out there came up after the service and in his own way, right straight from the farm, said, well, you put the hay where the cow can get it. I've had a lot of compliments, but I thought that is about as good as any that I'd <laughs> ever heard of. And that's our purpose. We go to Atlanta, the Lord willing, tomorrow for meetings at a little town of Conyers near Atlanta in the First Baptist Church and then over to San Marcos and San Antonio, Texas, and then we come back to Spartanburg, South Carolina, and then we go a little later to Mobile and Pascagoula for two meetings, and then up to Hampton Institute, which is a Negro school, a great school in Virginia, one of the best they have, and they invited me, the only white preacher on the conference program, and I don't know why. I didn't know they knew me from Adam, but I'm going up there for three days, and the Lord opens all kinds of unusual doors. I'm making my plans now for 76 because the next two years are filled as they ought to be, and too much so. It's all very strange to me because I don't make any effort to make dates. I don't even get out brochures with my picture on it because I figured my picture would drive off trade <laughs> instead of a trade. And uh, I haven't got any folders out telling what a great preacher I am with a lot of testimonials from about 25 places where I've been. I think I could scrape up that many, maybe, if I wanted to, but I just haven't done it, and yet the Lord has opened the doors all through the years, and that's all there is to it. It's just that 
just that simple. And I don't know any more about how it happens than anybody else, but that's the way it works. So uh, you need to remember this ministry, particularly in these months ahead. And we're in such strange times in this wo world and in this country that nobody knows what to expect. We don't know what to expect economically. You don't know what's going to happen to your money if you've got any or where to invest it if you had it because there isn't any such thing as security today. I don't care where you've got it. Uh, you've got no guarantee today savings and loan or anything else and you say, well, I'll buy some land. Well, you can be land poor. You know that. There isn't anywhere you can invest it except where God says, lay up treasure in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal where they don't have any uh, of the terrible things that we're reading about in the papers now. So in a very practical way tonight, I want to refer to two scriptures, one in Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, where God said to the prophet in verse 30, Also thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy word, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come, then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. And then over in James, uh, in uh, the first chapter, uh, verse 22, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now you notice there, you have out of the Old Testament and out of the New, these two parallel columns of truth. And as a capstone over both of them, I'd like to put John 13, 17, where our Lord said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. You see, I hope, the connection here. Uh, Ezekiel saying, uh, they hear thy words, but they do them not. And James, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And then our Lord says that the door to Christian happiness has two, it's really a double door, and both of them mark if. If you know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. <clears throat> you never needed a dictionary when you went to hear the Lord. <clears throat> All that he said generally, and as it stands in our Bible, is in monosyllables. I don't know of any simpler way to say this. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. There just isn't any simpler way to say that. You have the intellect, if you know these things. You have the emotions, happy are ye, and you have the will, if you do them. And that's what makes a personality. You have the head, if you know these things. You have the heart, happy are ye, and you have the hand, if you do them. Now, it doesn't say if you know these things, happy are ye, period. There's a lot of Bible knowledge today and a lot of well-taught congregations, at least much taught, all kinds of schools and conferences and churches. But I don't see many happy Christians. You don't either. <clears throat> Most of them don't look any happier, don't seem to be any more so than anybody else. When I say happy, I don't mean that slushy, sentimental happiness that ought to be spelled H-A-P-P-E-N in E-S-S, because it depends on what happens. Uh, it's the joy of the Lord that's in mind here, and it's a strange joy. It comes from a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. It's a deep and abiding joy. You don't have to go around with a, 
glorified grin on your face all the time. You have it sometimes and smile through tears. But it's a radiant and a victorious and a triumphant joy. The early Christians had it. And they were in trouble up to their ears most of the time and in jail a good deal of the time. But from jail, one of them could say rejoice in the Lord always. And then for fear we hadn't got it the first time. And again I say rejoice. Now, I don't see much of that today. I've been in a lot of strictly fundamental churches that were so cold that spiritual icicles were hanging all over the auditorium. A revival is a resurgence of Christian joy. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David hadn't lost his salvation. He had lost the joy of it. Philip went down to Samaria and had that evangelistic campaign. It wasn't a revival. I've always heard about Philip's revival in Samaria. It wasn't a revival. It wasn't anything down there to revive. They were all dead in trespasses and sins. But he went down and preached the gospel, and folks got saved, and there was joy, it says, in that city. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord, we read, after the resurrection. It doesn't say they were glad when Peter looked at John and Philip looked at Bartholomew. If you want to get miserable, just start looking around at church members. That'll ruin you. But they were happy when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said, if you know these things, uh, happy are ye if you do them. I don't hear many sermons on obedience, and that's what this is all about. Uh, I know that salvation, as somebody has said, is not spelled D-O, but D-O-N-E, because it's an accomplished work. That's right. But after you're saved, there's plenty to do. My Lord said, Ye are my friends if ye do the things which I command you. He that doeth the will of my father is my brother, sister, and mother. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, but he that doeth the will of my Father in heaven. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that heareth my words and doeth them shall be like a wise man to build his house on a rock. I have many times read the Great Commission, and I've left out two words, and most people never know the difference. I ask them, what two words did I leave out? And they, they never know. I leave out the words to observe. You'd be surprised. If I'd do it tonight, you wouldn't know I left it out, unless you might be a strict Bible student. It doesn't do any good to teach it if you don't teach folks to do it. Teaching, we're not just to disseminate information. That's not what we're called to do. Of course, they have to know what to do before they can do it, but it says teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Now, do you see the difference? You haven't learned it if you haven't learned to do it. In Luke 11, Jesus was preaching, and the woman got happy. Must have been an old-fashioned Methodist, and said what a wonderful thing it was to be uh, the mother of Jesus. And Jesus said, Yes, but rather blessed are they, they that hear the word of God and keep it. Now, I think he was saying, Sister, it's all right to say amen in the meeting, but the most important thing is to do the will of God. A lot of Bible teaching reminds me of swimming lessons on dry land. You don't learn how to swim till you get in the water. And we have a lot of dear people who have studied how to live the Christian life and have never made the plunge yet. The Bible is a light to our path, and that light's not to look at, but to walk in. You stand on a sunny day and stare at the sun, and you'll go blind. The very thing that gives you light will take away the light you have if you misuse it. And we are to walk in the light as he is in the light. And uh, if we look at it, it'll blind us. If we walk in it, we'll be blessed. Some dear people go from one church to another and from one conference to another and one preacher to another, always looking at the light and soaking up more information until they're blinded by an excess of light. Some people are blind in Africa tonight spiritually because they've never had the light. Plenty of people in America are blind because they've had too much. Because if you don't do something about it, it'll do something to you. 
You can't fool with the Word of God. Two things are equivalent to blindness. Lack of light and too much light. The old lady whose rule for reading the Bible was to read till she came to a commandment and then lay the Bible down and do the commandment had a pretty good rule. Now, we are to know it intellectually and obey it volitionally and we'll be happy emotionally. Some folks major on knowing and they become theologians, but there's not much joy with them. Others major on feeling and go in for experience and they're more or less unbalanced. And others go in for doing, and they work a lot in the church, but they don't have the combination. It takes all three to make a well-rounded Christian. It takes knowledge, it takes experience, and it takes activity, service. It's a matter of knowing the Word of God and doing the will of God. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. And James tells us, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Finney used to say, whereas mind and conscience may assent to the truth, when revival comes, obedience to the truth is the one thing that matters. And he gave the best definition of revival that I've ever heard. Revival is nothing less than a new beginning of obedience to God. Now, I don't see anything in there about hooping and hollering and a lot of excitement. You may get happy emotionally, but that's purely incidental. Revival is a new beginning of obedience to God. A lot of people don't want that kind of revival because that gets down where they live. Now, Ezekiel ministered in an evil time, and God said to him, I read it to you, he said, they'll talk about you, and they'll come, and they'll sit, and they'll hear, but they won't do what you're talking about. Well, he's not the only one that's had that experience. Isaiah had the same experience. God told him to go and preach. He said, they won't listen to you. And you read it in every one of the four Gospels, Acts and Romans. He said they won't hear it. James warns of the same evil, and I've never heard it quoted correctly. Everybody says, the Bible says, be ye doers the word, not hearers only, and they all stop right there. And that's not where the verse stops. The verse stops with deceiving your own selves. Don't you see what an awful thing that is? If you hear it and don't do it, you fool yourself. Let's get on with it. Self-deception. Now, sometimes you wonder, what good does this kind of preaching do? I've often wondered it. God said to Ezekiel, they won't listen to you, but you preach this way, and after you're gone, they'll have to say one thing, that a prophet has been among you, has been among you. And that's the one ambition that I have. I don't know how much good my preaching does. My only ambition is to preach it so that after I'm gone, they'll have to say that a prophet has been among us. We're not here to make it acceptable. We're here to make it available. We're not here to see that they like it. We're here to see that they get it. Now, there are certain things you can leave out and other things you can put in and be a popular preacher. But Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. And then immediately he said enough to discourage him. He said the time will come when they can't take it. They can't endure sound doctrine, but preach it anyhow. Old Alexander White, one of my favorite writers of years ago, said these people will appreciate your telling when the Gospels were read and the meaning of Eurocladon and Anathema Maranatha and all other such useless information. But if you preach on such subjects as try the tone and temper of their lives, these religious people cannot bear to be thus instructed. Oh, what a statement from that canny old Irishman, Scotsman. He knew you preach on worldliness and that a certain percentage of your crowd will get their little bucket full that very night, and they won't be back. They've had it because you dealt with their pet god, and uh, so they won't be back anymore. Old Billy Sunday used to say, they tell me that I rub the fur the wrong way. I don't. Let the cat turn around. 
I've discovered that when the cat's going the right direction, I'm stroking the cat. <laughs> when the cat's going the wrong way, the sparks fly. So I, I get encouraged when some folks don't like my preaching. Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. So God said to Ezekiel, you go ahead and preach it, and they'll, they'll know that you're a prophet after it's over. They'll have to say that. Beloved, the besetting sin of the saints today is hearing without doing. Now, they invited people to hear Ezekiel. They complimented him. His voice like an instrument. And they'll do it today. The centuries have passed, and dear folks come up and say, I enjoyed the sermon, which is about the worst thing they could say about some sermons because they aren't meant for enjoyment to begin with. You may do nothing about this book, but it'll do something to you. You can't go out that door tonight like you came in because you've been exposed to the Word of God. And that's not Shakespeare. And that's not Emerson. This is the Word of God. And the same sun that shines on ice and melts it will shine on clay and harden it. And the Word of God either humbles or hardens every heart that it touches. It always does something to you. This idea that, well, I don't think much happened this morning. Don't kid yourself. Truth that is heard and not acted upon is a dangerous thing because it has a reaction. The danger with a lot of movies is that uh, they breed emotional drunkards. People go there and get all excited about what they see. And, uh, we have religious drunkards today and Bible conference drunkards and revival drunkards who go and get their souls all stirred up and then they do nothing about it and there's a reaction, there's a letdown, their muscles become flabby and they lose their capacity for being aroused. We delude ourselves. We're in a time now when everybody can hear preaching anytime. When I was a boy growing up, it was hard to come by a good preacher. Out there in the country, we only heard two sermons a month on the fourth Saturday afternoon and Sunday morning. Of course, some of them are long enough to last a month, but that's all you heard. <laughs> Nowadays, one of the great problems that we're up against is that we, it's too easy to hear it. I heard Billy Sunday, but I had to go a distance to hear him, and now Billy Graham and all the rest of them are available anytime. The flick of a TV or a radio or a recorder, and you've got it. Well, now, there are wonderful advantages in radio and TV and all the rest of it, but there are dangers. There's the danger of overexposure. And we get used to it. It's a perilous thing. You can hear the best preaching there is today so easily. It doesn't mean anything much. And we become spectators. And it doesn't stir us. The Word of God is supposed to arouse you. And you take a stimulant long enough and you have to keep increasing the dose. A doctor's wife said to me some time ago about these wonder drugs that the trouble is that people take them for every little pain they have. And then when they have sure enough trouble, sometimes they've developed an immunity to them. And they don't help them. When you bought an alarm clock and set it up there at the head of the bed and it went off the first morning, you uh, came to with a start, but you keep on paying no attention to it and turning it off, and it won't mean anything. I see a lot of people turn off the sermon halfway through. Uh, they've signed off. I might as well have quit as far as they're concerned. They didn't get another word I said. Uh, it's uh, easily done. And then we forget that we are not onlookers, we're participants. Jesus said, take heed how you hear. It's just as important how you hear. It's what you hear. Now, God forbid that you go out tonight comparing this preacher with any other. God never meant it for entertainment, and we're doing our dead level best to bring in the world, the flesh, and the devil today to make the gospel entertaining. 
It's the last thing God ever meant for the gospel to be entertained. And we've brought in this weird music today and uh, a lot of other tricks that we say, well, you, people have to be entertained. No, they don't, not with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's a device that we think is necessary. You say the end justifies the means. The trouble is the means determines the end. If you use an unworthy means, you've spoiled the purpose before you've ever gotten to it. It's a perilous thing. God meant to prick our hearts with the message. The fowls of the air are waiting just outside the church to gobble up the seed of the word the minute you get out the door. James says it's a mirror and you look in it and then go and forget what manner of person you are. People come up and say, Preacher, you're right. You told us the truth. And I feel like saying, Well, what are you going to do about it? Finney, the great revivalist, was a lawyer when God saved him. And he went at it like a lawyer. He presented the case, the evidence, and then he said, Now, what are you going to do about it? In the very first meeting, he made some of the folks mad and they all got up and left. And his companion said, Well, they'll be back maybe tonight. And they came back mad, but back and under conviction. He was pleading for a verdict. This attitude of I move we accept the sermon as information and be dismissed is a dangerous thing today. From start to finish, beloved, the word of God joins creed with deed, and if cursed be he that handleth the word of God deceitfully, one way to do that is to hear it and not do it. There's one thing worse than not coming to church, and that is coming to church and doing nothing about it. That's worse than not going because you've got an extra load of responsibility for the sermon you heard. Sin will keep you from the book, and the book will keep you from sin. It's not the word that's hidden in your, heart, in your head, but the word that's hidden in your heart that does the work. You can have a head full of scripture and a heart full of sin. You can backslide teaching the Sunday school class with your Bible in front of you. Something must be done about the word of God. I know it won't return void. That's what God said in effect to Ezekiel. He said uh, they'll have to say a prophet's been among them. But it's not a lollipop to roll under our tongue. The word did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. There has to be a volitional response, as the old hymn has it, faith taking hold of the word. Well, you say we have faith. Yes, but what kind do you have? My Bible says, by faith Abraham obeyed. <clears throat> to obey is better than sacrifice. A Christian is one who trusts God's promises and obeys God's commandments. You have a break in the meeting when people start obeying God. The test of your love for Jesus Christ is obedience. <clears throat> John 14, 21 makes that very plain. Some people say, I don't know what's the matter with me. Jesus is not real to me. And how do you make Jesus real? Well, he told us in the 14th chapter, in the 21st verse, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved in my Father." And I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. To whom? To those who hear his word and do it. Every duty we omit obscures some truth we might have known. Let me ask you tonight. Are you on the old T and O, the trust and the bay? That's the best road in the world. You have heard it. Do you intend to do anything about it? And the reason why a lot of Christians have no happiness, they're not obedient Christians. Because Jesus said, if you know it, you're happy if you do it. Knowing it isn't enough. You must do it. I wonder if you can honestly say tonight, I have heard the word of God. I've heard it this week. I do not accept it merely as information. I've been a hearer. I intend to be a doer. I want God to know, and I want the people to know. I intend by the Holy Spirit to put into practice the truths I've heard. And that's why the old song, Truth and Obey, 
comes in so strong. It's, you no, know, I used to ride a lot on the B and O and the C and O, but the best road in all the world is this old T and O, and uh, it says some very searching things. And in a moment, we're going to sing it, number two hundred and sixty, but we're going to sing it a different way. Instead of singing all the way through when we walk with the Lord, the trouble is we get lost in the crowd singing it that way. We all the way through. I want us to sing it tonight when I walk with the Lord in the light of his word. What a glory he sheds on my way while I do his good will. He abides with me still and with all who will trust in the best. And then that verse 3, but I never can prove the delights of his love until all on the altar I lay for the favor he shows and the joy he bestows or for them who will trust in the best. And then, then in fellowship sweet I'll sit at his feet or I'll walk by his side in the way what he says I will do. Now are you, are you sure you can say that tonight? You see, we've always sung it we, and we just we lost in the crowd, you know, sort of a general application. Where he sends, I will go. Never fear. Only trust in the best. Now, you've heard the word here, and you've not only heard it this week, you hear it here every Sunday, and you know that, and you've been exposed to enough Bible to have made a mature Christian out of you a long time ago, and you've heard enough in this church to turn the whole community upside down. But what happens? We don't do it. I want tonight for the pastor, when we stand to sing this, to stand down here. And you know I don't put on our parades. We haven't had one this week. And I uh, don't do it unless there's a reason for it. I want to know how many of you. Now, can I trust you to be honest? To sing it when I, and so on, I, I, all the way through. And if you're willing to say tonight, I've heard the word of God here, and I'm saying tonight, I mean to do something about what I've heard. And I'm coming down, preacher, to take your hand. You are the shepherd of this flock. I want you to tell him what you've come for, don't you? Let him have to ask you. You tell him that I am coming down tonight to say that I've heard and I intend to do something about it. And before God and before men, I'm saying tonight, I intend to do what I've heard. Now, that's obedience. I believe you're a little bit too serious to dare to walk down here, as I've seen people do in the past, with a sort of a careless look and a mouthful of chewing gum and shake hands with the preacher and go glibly out with no intention under the sun of doing one blessed thing about it. Don't you come that way. I don't want you to go out here worse off than you were when you came in. You sure will if you don't mean it. I'd rather have a dozen people come down here. I mean to do. Now, if you can't, I won't condemn you. I'll not bowl you out from up here if you can't come. I'm not your judge. But do be honest about this because you'll go out with a greater load of condemnation than you had when you came in to do that. I want us to stand and have a word of prayer first, and then we're going to sing, and I want you to do what I have mentioned, if you will and can honestly.